the show, everybody. It is Friday. The weekend is here, and we G are going G is on my in. side. G is on this <laughs> side today. Welcome, G. And uh, we have a very special guest here today. Uh, he is one of the reasons why I went into broadcasting, so you can thank him. Our first guest is truly a broadcasting legend. He has interviewed just about anyone you can think of, and then some. Here is just a small sample. Can we clear up a rumor that when people are printing, there was a rift? No, not true. What happened? Dean Martin is a man who doesn't like to work. Scarface. That great line. My little friend. Oh, say hello to my little friend. Yes. <laughs> we'll come back with Marlon Brando. There's lots of other things to no, talk I'm about. No, I'm leaving now. It doesn't matter what he says. No, and we'll, we're going to take... A special treat tonight, an hour with Madonna. If we have to tell you who she is, you have severe problems. How do, <laughs> I how heard do, a noise and we came out of the hotel and headed for the limousine. And I heard some noise, and I thought it was firecrackers. You like being a father? I'm a, I'm a great father. Great, yeah. I'm a like great you. father. You're there. I want to be my son. <laughs> Please welcome the one and only Larry King. Thank you for being here. Good morning. <laughs> you must get that everywhere you go. Well, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> well, after all these years, you know, I've been in the, I've broadcast in seven decades. I started in 1957, so I've been in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010. Wow. Yeah. If I have last another three years, I'll be on the air 60 years. Wow. wow. You're, you're going to get there. And you started in radio. I started, uh, I started on radio in, uh, I started in Miami in 19, May 1st, 1957. It's all I ever wanted to do. Radio. Be on the radio. When I was a kid, I'd be five years old, and I'd look at the radio and listen to, you know, the shadow nose and yeah. a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> and I would then <clears throat> go into the bathroom and imitate that. It was five. And I wanted to keep you in suspense. I just, I loved the radio. And then when I was like 12 years old, I'd go around New York City and visit shows where they had studio audiences. I'd watch quiz shows and everything. I just wanted to be a broadcaster. My father had died when I was nine. And then finally I got into radio by going down to Miami. Someone suggested I get down. I was 22 years old. Mm. Got off the train. First thing I saw was, <laughs> was a water fountain. It said colored. And I'd wow. never seen that. Really? For, so yeah. I drank out of it. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> was anybody around to see you drink out of it? No. That, well, I was just a kid. Yeah. Uh, got off a train. Then I got on a bus to go over to Miami Beach to live with my uncle, who had a little apartment there. His wife had died, my aunt. And uh, I'm sitting in the back of the bus, and the bus driver pulls over and says, points to me. He says, you move up front. The back is for Negroes. Mm -hmm. I, I come from New York. I've never seen this. Yeah. So I said, my father's Negro. <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to do? And I drove over, and that started my... Then I got a job at a small station. And I'll, you want to hear a story of my first day? Yes, sure. okay. we love stories. <laughs> my first day on the air. Uh -huh. All right, I finally get a, a small station hires me. I'm going to be a dish jockey. <laughs> and I'm very nervous. I'm going to start on Monday morning, May 1st, 1957. I stay up all weekend. I'm practicing my music. You know, good morning, good morning. The temperature, the top, top, top trying everything. I don't go to sleep. I'm scared. But big day. Yeah. Now it's Monday morning. I go on at 9 o'clock. 10 to 9. I'm nervous putting all my records together. And the general, I go into the general manager's office and he says, good luck. And this is your big day. I said, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and he says, what name are you going to use? <laughs> what name am I going to My name is Larry Zeiger. He said, no, that won't work. What do you mean? He says, no, it's too ethnic. Now you could use that. He says, sure. It's too ethnic. People don't know how to spell it. You need another name. What am I going to do? I'm nine minutes to go on the air. So he has the Miami Herald open. There was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he said, uh, how about Larry King? I said, sounds fine. I said, okay, you're Larry King. Now I go in. I changed my legally a year later. Now I go in. I sit down, put on the record, Les Elgarth swinging down the lane. Da -da 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 -da. I lower the microphone, lower the record, put on the mic. Nothing comes out. I bring the record back up. I lower the record, nothing comes out. All the audience is hearing is a record going up. <laughs> I'm scared of that. I'm telling myself that my whole career is ruined because I'm scared. And the general manager, Marshall Simmons, he kicks open the door to the control room. And he said, this is a communications business. Damn it, communicate. 
And I turned on the mic and I said, good morning. My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've ever said that. Uh -huh. They just gave me that name. And I've been scared. All my life I want to be in radio and I've been nervous. And the general manager just kicked open the door yeah. and said, communicate. So I better communicate. And I learned something that day that I stayed with me my whole career to this minute. Just be honest. Yeah. I never was nervous again. Hmm. I just. Wow. It's, That's be it's a good tip. Yeah. It's a good tip for anybody. I wrote a book called How to Talk to Anyone Anytime Anyway. You know, the biggest fear people have is public, public speaking. speaking. Yeah. Sure. And the the best advice. I was speaking in in. Uh, in Portland, Oregon the other day, and the guy preceding me had to introduce me, and he said, I've never introduced anyone. He said, I'm scared. I said, tell him. And he went up and he said, I'm very nervous. Yeah. Well, so the audience all understood that. Mm -hmm. So you put the audience in your book. So now any goof I made that morning, they would have understood. And they were pulling day. for you. And they're pulling for you. Exactly. So you got everything going. Now, I didn't notice psychologically, but it worked. Right. Yeah. And and, and you have uh, you've interviewed just about everyone, as I mentioned, politicians, dignitaries. Yeah. I've been very lucky. Celebrities. Who stands out the most? Like if, if I have to say pick your top three, who are your, your favorite guests? That's going to be Frank fun. Sinatra, because mm -hmm. he was so hard to get. And Jackie Gleason got him for me. Mm -hmm. And Jackie was your mentor. Jackie right? was very close to me and great to me. Mm -hmm. There's Frank. Frank was and he became great friends with me. One of my prized possessions at home is a Great letter from Frank Sinatra that he sent me. Marlon Brando, because he was hard to get. Mm-hmm. Brando, that was funny. You yeah, that kissed, was funny. He kissed you on he the air. He kissed me on the air. <laughs> well, how did that go down? I had no idea. It was the end of the interview, and we were singing songs, and he was a, a lovely man. I got to be his friend. And, and suddenly, he burst into song, and I sang with him. And then, just as we finished, I said, good night, thank you, Marlon, and he kissed me. On the lips. Watch. I think you'll see. Yeah, here's a look of it here. So the two of you are singing mm -hmm. together. Right. Can you carry it too? No, no. Right. <laughs> now, when, 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 when people ask me about that moment, I always say the same thing. I, up to that point and to this point, have never been kissed on the lips by a man in my life. And I can't stop thinking about them. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, I've had uh, seven presidents: uh, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, too many people. Jimmy mm -hmm. Hoffa. I mean, it goes. Uh, but Hoffa you haven't had the first female president, which we could have coming up here. Yeah, so yeah I've interviewed Hillary many times. I know, but not as the female president. I, I know you can't wait to get your hands on well, that. I, I remember the first time I interviewed Hillary. She was sitting under a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt. And I told her, you know, mm -hmm. I interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt. And she went, <laughs> what was she like? Because she believes that she tunes into Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. wow. She's a little weird, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I recently heard a story about, about a run-in that you had with a famous politician-to-be. And, and you got in a fender bender with him. Is there any truth to this? Oh, this is a really unusual story. Um, we were dish jockeys in Miami group of young guys, and one of us, I don't know if it was my car or some car, but I was driving. We'd never seen Palm Beach. You know, Palm Beach was uh -huh. kind of a mystic place to us. So it's about a 50-mile drive. We drove up on a Sunday, beautiful Sunday morning, kind of day like it's here in Chicago today, beautiful Sunday morning, Christmas to the air. Might have been January. And we're driving up along A1A, the water on our left, the mansions on our, the water on our right, the water, the mansions on our left. Mm -hmm. And I'm going about 10 miles an hour, of course, we're looking, and there's a guy in a convertible stopped at a red light, Worth Avenue, and I didn't stop in time, so I hit him. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Head bounced, going 10 miles an hour. He gets out of the car, and he says to me, how could you hit me? With two cars, it's Sunday morning, I'm stopped at a red light, <laughs> you're, going you're 10 driving, miles an hour. how could you hit me? And I said, well, uh, you know, we're four guys. We've never been to Palm Beach, and we were looking around at all the sites. You want to change license plates or something? No, I just tapped you. He said, no, but raise your right arm. He says, I'm Senator John Kennedy. <laughs> and in two years, I'm going to run for president. Swear you'll vote for me. <laughs> wow. I've, I've led an interesting life. Yes, yes, you have. <laughs> I, I can't. I pinch. You know, I have a trophy room at home. 
of all the things I've collected over the years and awards I've gotten and <clears throat> lifetime achievement awards, which, which was really weird. I got a lifetime achievement award from the Emmys three years ago in New York. It was a big honor. And then this year I got nominated for an Emmy for my internet show. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was impossible because I thought if you get a lifetime achievement award, your okay. life is over. Yeah. <laughs> How can you get nominated again? So I gotta go back and get it. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with something. But when every time I walk into that room of mine, I pinch myself because I'm, I go back to still being that little Jewish kid from Brooklyn who wanted to be on the radio. Mm -hmm. I, I never forgot my roots. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you from a viewer. This is from uh, Sarah Rendon. She says, who's the one great interview that got away that you never got to interview and the least favorite person that you wish you had not interviewed? Mm, that's a good one. Uh, the one who got away first. The one who got away was Fidel Castro. I went down to Havana. We, we met with some of the leaders down there. Ted Turner tried to help because he's a friend of his. Because nobody held a, ran a country for more years than Castro. So forget your politics. He ran that country over 50 years. Right? We never made that connection. And if I could not do anyone again, I guess it would have been Ahmed Dinejad of Iran. Because oh. mm. he drove me a little nuts. You know, <laughs> he, he drove me a little nuts because uh, he was talking about Israel and the Middle East and he said, well, if there were a Holocaust. And I said, what? He said, well, if there were a Holocaust, are you saying if? Mm -hmm. you know, and I got into it, so it really annoyed me. Right. But he had all a bunch of Iranians around, so I couldn't get too annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> He's smart. Well, one, your best behavior. one day once in New York, I interviewed him and Yasser Arafat and uh, Chavez of Venezuela and the head of Libya. Wow. All in one day. Oh, wow. Right. So I, hey. A lot of my luck, a lot of this is luck. Paul Newman told me once, any successful person who discussing his or her career doesn't use the word luck is a liar. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's a left turn. What if I didn't go down to Miami? Right. Yeah. 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 Opportunity and yeah. fate. You know, some of it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to have more with Larry Key coming up I'm right coming after back? this. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're coming back. We right might back. not let you go. <laughs> Larry King, and we feel like this show just would not be right to have you here without taking a caller. Right. <laughs> we just have to. So, we have Tim Owens from Glendale Heights on the phone. Would you like to say hello? Hey, Tim, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, Larry? I'm fine. Yeah, What's up? A question. I was curious how your love for suspenders began. How did the suspenders begin? I was, uh, I had had heart surgery. Uh, I had bypass surgery and I lost some weight and I was having dinner with my ex-wife. I've had a few of those. And, uh, <laughs> she said, you know, you wear sweaters and stuff. Do you ever try suspenders? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, well, you know, you look trim, you look good. Why don't you try them? So the next night I wore suspenders and three or four people called in and said, you look good. And well, that's all I had to hear. <laughs> and I've uh, worn them ever since. What year yeah. were we talking about? What year, wh how long have you been wearing the suspenders? How many decades? I, yeah, this 1988. 88, mm. okay. Yeah, well. yeah, well, Larry, you know what? Uh, I want to look good. And um, I got a confession <laughs> to make. How does this look? <laughs> Not quite the same. I can answer for you, Larry. Not the Tim, same. Tim, I'm glad you called in. I was waiting. <laughs> So what in the entire hour to bust these out? Uh, you want to know something? What do you think, Larry? First of all, it's a nice look. <laughs> it's a good color. And why don't you try wearing them? All right. Just, no, do you think any, he needs a tie with it or without the tie? Either way. And you, you don't need a jacket anymore. No? no wear this. <laughs> wear this. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you, you, you might be tabbed another Larry King, but you could avoid that. Don't wear a tie. Oh. I always wore a tie. Don't wear a tie. Leave it open so a little of the hair. I don't know. <laughs> All right, audience, what do you think? You like the suspenders, audience? Yeah. All right, we'll give it a shot. I don't know. I feel like you need a pickup truck and some hay yeah, or something behind. I, know. <laughs> I mean, they are red. I like the look, but the only thing is, 
Don't wear a belt. I know. Well, yeah. I didn't want you to. I didn't want to tip you off that I was wearing. These. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> if you wear a belt and suspenders, it means you're not sure about your pants. <laughs> I hear that you have a story about Joan Rivers mm -hmm. that no one's heard, and we're dying to hear it here. Oh, well, uh, Joan was a great friend and one of the funniest, funniest people I've ever lived, and one of the brightest people I ever knew. Mm -hmm. She was uh, Phi Beta Kappa, she was valedictorian at her uh, college, Barnard, which is the sister college of Columbia. So, and a lot of her humor came from being brilliant, because mm -hmm. to do that kind of stabbing humor, mm -hmm. you have to be really smart. Anyway, I had her on the air years ago, and uh, Pia Zadori, remember Pia Zadori? She was kind of a singer, she wasn't really a talent. You know, she was a nice kid, but really had no great talent. Her husband, <laughs> husband was very wealthy, and he, yeah. anyway, there was a rumor that Pia Zadora was gonna do the play, The Diary of Anne Frank. She was gonna play Anne Frank, the Jewish girl hidden in Vienna, by this couple from the Nazis who gets killed at the end of her diary. So Joan said, Pia Zadora as Anne Frank, after 20 minutes, the audience would stand up and yell, she's in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Joan. Only Joan. <laughs> yes, she was never worried about couching anything, right? Uh, uh, she had some yes, nice stuff. certainly missed. I know that growing up you lost your father really early. Yeah. Um, did your mother get to see your success? She saw it in Miami. She came down to lived in Miami the last eight years of her life and I got very successful in Miami. Knew Jack, she knew Jackie yeah. Gleason. Yeah. She would go to the Fountain Blue with me to show. She knew Sinatra. She, so she, got, she never saw me go national. But uh, is that where your drive came from, sort of? I, get, I just, uh, I love the business so much. I never, I never wanted to be Larry King. I just wanted to broadcast. I wanted to communicate. I thought I'd be a baseball announcer. In fact, the event I'm doing tonight with Charlie Steiner, who's the voice of the Dodgers, uh, we're going to do an event at the Museum of Broadcast Communications sure, on sure. State Street. And I think there's some tickets left. If yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. wants to come over, uh, and he's going to interview me. And it's called an Evening with Larry King, and that's what I wanted to be. That's that. What I wanted to be was a, a radio announcer and do the Dodger games. That would have been life deluxe. <laughs> right. Well, you are throwing so, out the first pitch tonight, right, at this Wrigley? This afternoon. This yeah. afternoon, yep. So I. <laughs> and the old arm is ready. <laughs> You've done it before. You know not to bounce the ball, of course, yes. right? I, I've thrown strikes. Yes. I, 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 oh. good. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of a thrill for a kid, you know, to... Mm. I've done it at Yankee Stadium. I've done it at Dodger Stadium. I've done it in San Francisco. And, it's a lot of fun to go out on the mound and stand there and throw the pitch and the crowd looking on and you hope you don't, you know, make a jerk of yourself. <laughs> my two boys, I've got boys, you know, I'm, I'm 80 years old and my, what? <laughs> you know, uh, I have two boys, I have grown children, but I have two boys 15 and 14 and they've thrown out first pitches uh -huh. and they're both athletes. And when people see me and my wife, there's obviously an age difference. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, you know, you know, so I always say the same thing. You know, they look at me, they look at her, and I know what they're thinking, so I always say the same thing. Hey, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> 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 you and Ryan have that in common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, no, not the younger women. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> so, but you like the pretty blondes, huh? I, I, I've always liked uh, women. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I've been attracted to blondes, but I, I know the mother of my daughter uh, had dark hair. I, I just I like I like I like women. I just uh, I don't know I don't know why. <laughs> you, you appreciate no, their no, beauty. I, I remember Jerry Falwell. I used to get in arguments with him because Jerry <laughs> Falwell said, "If you're gay, you choose to be gay. You choose to be gay. In other words, you say, a gay, straight, gay, I think I'll be gay. Why would someone choose to be gay? You know, mm -hmm. it don't make sense. It has to be a gene or something. So I said to him, Jerry, when did you choose to be heterosexual? <laughs> if it's a choice of one, sure. it has to be a choice of the other. He says, well, it's natural. Well, if it's natural for you, why isn't it natural mm -hmm. for them? You know, mm -hmm. I remember when I, I knew when I was heterosexual when I was 10 years old. Did mm -hmm. you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What, 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 what was her name, Larry? Uh, it was my cousin. <laughs> it was your cousin? My cousin oh. Loretta. No, no, nothing happened. My cousin, <laughs> I was 10. My cousin Loretta, I think she was 18 or 19, came to the house for dinner. We lived in a little apartment. 
And so it was my mother, my younger brother, cousin Loretta, my mother, and me. And something dropped on the floor. <gasps> and I got down on the floor to find it. And there were Loretta's legs. <laughs> and I tell you, I got so excited. And I didn't know why I was excited. Yeah. But I knew then. <laughs> yeah. And it was done. Oh, man. I wish we had more yes. time. You can tell us stories for the whole hour. Yes. I swear we'd love it. But we are out of time. I knew then that there's something better than Herbie. <laughs> Well, listen, if you want tickets for an evening with Larry King, which I suggest you get because you're going to get probably get way more stories than this at the Museum of Broadcast of Communications tonight, go to our website. We have all the information right there. Larry, if you're ever back in Chicago, come on by. Anytime. Yes. One of my favorite cities. Have I said, like I used to say, if Chicago had Los Angeles weather, the whole world would live. But you got That's that right. right. We're going to see Larry in uh, After Dark. Two-minute warning with Larry. Later, we have the four must-have trends for the fall. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Be right back.